Do you like standing in a queue for your vegetables? Or do you think it's tiring and a waste of valuable time? Do you ever find your long wait has been useless, that supplies of what you want have run out before your turn comes? It's not the greengrocer's fault. It's up to you. Dig for victory. Thousands of people have discovered that a ten-rod plot will keep a family of five in vegetables eight months of the year. Young men are doing it. These London AFS men are filling in their waiting periods like this. And young women, these girls are using part of their lunch hour to work on plots in their own factory grounds. Old men, even at 83. And children, growing food is part of their school routine nowadays. For they know that food is just as important a weapon of war as guns. Have you joined the ranks of this great new army that's helping to win the war by helping themselves to good food? You may not be lucky enough to own an ideal kitchen garden like this, but the flower garden will grow beetroot just as well as begonias. And it's more fashionable too nowadays. There may be room for vegetables on top of your Anderson shelter or in the backyard, or even on that flat bit of roof. Even the asphalt playground of a bombed out school has been turned into a flourishing allotment. So you see, you can nearly always find somewhere to dig. You know, it only takes an hour or two a week to keep a ten rod plot cultivated, and you can all lend a hand, women and children too. Perhaps you're only making excuses. Perhaps the real trouble is you think gardening's a bore. We're going to watch an old hand for a few minutes, and if you get any pleasure out of watching his skill, you'll get a lot more in learning how to do a good job yourself. Digging's simple enough if you don't try and lift the whole allotment in one spadeful. Cut off just as much as your spade will lift. Drive the spade in with your foot. Then, over it goes just where you want it. And for goodness sake, keep your spade clean. Follow these tips and choose your company and you'll find that digging can be good fun. The exciting time comes when the first seeds must be sown. The ground must be level and it must have what gardeners call a fine tilth. And the old hand treads the ground to fill up any hollow. Finally, an iron rake gives you the fine tilth that the seeds want. That's one of the pleasures of gardening, using the right tool for the job and using it in the right way. To make the seed drills, a hoe is the tool. Use it in short strokes to throw the soil clear. Tread on the line to make sure your hoe doesn't shift it. And this is the proper way to cover the seeds in the drill. You're sure to be planting potatoes, so remember, as soon as the sets arrive, place them out in shallow boxes and keep them somewhere that's frost-proof and light. Then you won't get these spindly, overgrown horrors, but short, healthy shoots like this. By the way, you can economize by cutting big seed in half. The proper tool for covering in the trenches is your foot, and then the hoe to finish off. Finally, fork between the rows to let air into the ground. Now to our onions. The seedlings should be lifted with a fork and planted in their permanent quarters with a trowel. You use a fork for lifting cabbages and plant them with a dibber like this. While you lift leeks with a spade, plant them with a dibber. You see, there's a proper tool for every job. And they needn't be expensive, especially if you borrow them from the man next door. A draw hoe is best for fairly widely spaced crops, but a hand hoe is ideal when you're working with plants close together. And when it comes to the wide open spaces between rows, a Dutch hoe is the thing. And remember, you use it walking backwards. 
that the finest tools a gardener can possibly use are his own two hands. Take a few tips like these from the old gardeners and you'll soon be growing your own tomatoes, peas that melt in the mouth, carrots that will be a revelation, potatoes at your service whenever you want them, and cabbages fit for a king. There's a bit of ground waiting for you somewhere. And surely, isn't an hour in the garden better than an hour in the queue? Surrounded by the red roofs of Londoners' homes is Kew Gardens. It's a world garden, for in it grow flowers and shrubs and trees from every country in the world. It's also a playground where Londoners seeking a moment of release from war and work may rest while their children play. They come to queue in early spring when yellow daffodils bring thoughts of summer sunshine. They come to queue in the bright light of May when the cherry blossom is falling. And when Japanese cherry and English apple are gone, like blue sea waves, the bluebells flow through the woods. Then English spring is at its height. They come to see the flowers from mountain peaks. Flowers from the topless Himalayas, the Rockies, the Andes and the Alps. Flowers come down from the roof of the world to decorate the rock garden. In the hothouses, the air is heated and continually sprayed with water until it's heavy with moisture. And here is to be seen a gallery of nature's most exotic creations from tropic swamp and jungle. The struggle for survival in the teeming life of the tropics has produced plants with ingenious devices for protection and attack. There are plants that live by extracting nitrogen from insects instead of from the soil. There's a scented sticky juice on these hairs. Flies are attracted by the scent and caught. If insects touch the center of that leaf, Plants' digestive juices extract the nitrogen. If an animal touches this mimosa, or if heat is brought near it, it pretends to die. Then there are plants which grow in the desert. They're ordinary plants, but they've learned to store food in their fleshy leaves to last them through long periods of drought. Sometimes the leaf is covered with fur to reduce evaporation. 
Sometimes the food is stored in the stems and the leaves disappear or become prickles, but always they modify their shape as they try to reduce the surface of skin exposed to the sun. Now the shape which mathematically exposes the least surface is the sphere. Here from South Africa is the perfect cactus, a small round ball. Yet these weird plants produce lovely flowers, for like all plants they attract the bees and insects which pollinate them by means of perfume and bright colour. Thank you.